Which of these is the efficient way to strengthen the axle of an overland expedition vehicle? Well, watch this video and you'll soon find out. Now, if we accept the hearsay evidence that there are 4x4s out there with axles which, which are a little bit marginal for serious overlanding, it means we're going to have to do some axle strengthening sooner or later. And I'm talking here about vehicles which are heavily loaded up to the GVM, maybe beyond, and doing extended mileages over dirt tracks, corrugations, you name it, doing enormous fatigue damage uh, to the suspension. And our principal interest will be to reduce the fatigue stresses in order to prolong life. We aren't mainly interested in increasing the actual strength, although this will be a side benefit. Now I had a look on the internet, see what's available, and I found there was a whole world out there which I knew very little about, with many different strengthening kits being marketed, mainly in the US, but I didn't find a single kit which came close to uh, the Overlanders requirements. Now I do accept that um, these kits are designed mainly for a different clientele, for the extreme off-roaders, for the rock crawlers, you name it, and they have a very different set of design requirements, one of which would appear to be that the axle reinforcement should look the part and should add street cred. Just a word about my background, I spent over four decades in the offshore oil and gas industry and the structures we dealt with were all subject to environmental loads and so avoidance of fatigue and fracture was just part of our working life. I also worked for a company uh, which designed and built offshore platforms mainly on a fixed price basis and for us the most profitable world was the one you didn't have to make and this does rather colour your thinking. So let's look at the design requirements. Now way back when I did the part 4 video in this series I showed a typical bending moment diagram for a live axle and this represents the uh, principal load which has to be resisted by the axle and it starts at uh, zero out at the hub builds up to a maximum at the spring carrier and is essentially constant through the central section of the axle and I would expect to see this reflected in the design of any strengthening system but sadly this isn't the case and the typical strengthening kit is tapered and you'll find it has maximum depth in the center at the diff housing it'll pass over the top of the diff housing in some cases it uh, bridges over the diff housing in other cases it's welded to it now the diff housing is, is enormously strong made of cast steel it's a very deep section and I simply don't see the need for the axle strengthening uh, to pass over the top of it. For me, a much more logical design is to have a constant depth section uh, which is governed by the bending moment at the spring carrier, carrying through as far as the diff housing and welded to it. And the welding isn't difficult, providing the correct procedure is followed. I show a couple of examples of stiffened axles. The first one, I freely admit I don't understand the thinking which has gone into the design of this. And the second one here, it seems to me to be much more logical and a much more efficient design. Now let's look at the optimum section to use for reinforcing axles. Now looking on the internet, I see that all the proprietary systems, they use channel sections or U sections which are bent up from steel plate. And these are slotted over the top of the axle tube. The side pieces reach down almost the centre line of the tube and they're welded off longitudinally. And just to get the terminology right, the horizontal piece at the top, that's the flange, and that does the bulk of the work in resisting the bending moment. And the two side pieces are called webs, and really all they've got to do is to connect the flange to the axle tube. Now in the structural steel industry, these sections aren't greatly used because they're not very efficient in resisting bending moment. Not a good use of the material. Much more widely used are I-beams uh, and these have thick flanges and thin webs which reflect the relative tasks they both have to do. Now if we want to replace a proprietary system 
with a standard section, we need to match up the size of the flanges in order to get the same load capacity. Now, a typical proprietary system is bent up from 3 8 plate, or in metric terms, that's 9.5 millimetres thick. And looking up in the section tables, the nearest equivalent I-beam would be an IPE220, and this has a 9.2 millimetre thick flange, 110 wide. The whole section is 220 deep, and it's got a 6 millimetre web. Now if we slit this longitudinally down the middle of the web, we end up with two T-sections. Very convenient if we were going to do front and rear axles, one for each. And if we weld the web to the axle tube, we're going to get much the same bending capacity as with the proprietary system, albeit it's going to be much lighter and rather cheaper too. Now if the axle reinforcement's in the form of a U, this can bring its own fabrication problems. If it's supplied in its final form, when it's offered up, there may or may not be a good fit. And I'll show here an example. The U was too tight, it didn't sit well over the axle tube, and there was a huge gap at the diff housing. So the section had to be taken away, put in a hydraulic press, opened up, and on a trial and error basis, adjusted until a good fit out was obtained. Now this is both time consuming and also not every, everyone's going to have a hydraulic press, are they? The alternative is to provide the whole thing to kit parts. The individual pieces can be offered up individually, adjusted, aligned. You then tack them together and weld them out. But this is a major amount of welding. And to someone like me who regards every additional weld as being an engineering failure, well, I think the whole approach is uh, completely disastrous. I would point out the obvious fact that if your reinforcement is in the form of a structural T with a single web, the fit-up's going to be an absolute doddle, and the worst you're going to have to do is a bit of touching up with a grinding wheel to adjust the welding gap. Also, regarding the welding itself, the size of the welds is going to be governed by the thickness of the plates being joined together. So in the case of a U-section, you're going to end up with two 10mm butt welds. And these are big, consume a lot of weld metal, and you're putting a lot of heat into the system. And you really want to control distortions on the axle tube. On the other hand, the structural T, uh, the web can be joined just with two 5mm fillet welds. And this is a very neat and a very economical welding solution. The final decision to take is where to weld on the reinforcing. Before we go any further, let's just remind ourselves of our objective. And this is to improve the fatigue life of the axle. And this requires us to minimise the fluctuating tensile stresses in the axle casing. Now let's just look at the uh, situation uh, starting with an unreinforced axle and if you apply bending moment to it you get equal and opposite compressive and tensile stresses in the top and bottom of the axle respectively and I'll show the maximum tensile stress with the red arrow. Now the conventional place to put the reinforcing is on top of the axle and if we do this we pull the neutral axis upwards and although the uh, overall stresses are reduced, the maximum tensile stress still occurs in the bottom of the axle casing and it could still be at a damaging level. A much more efficient place to put the reinforcing to reduce the stresses is underneath the axle and if you do this you pull the neutral axis downwards and the maximum tensile stress in the axle casing as indicated by the red arrow, is very much reduced. The overall maximum tensile stress now occurs in the reinforcing, but this shouldn't be a problem. You're not going to have welded attachments there, and it's not going to be fatigue sensitive. Now doing it this way, we do reduce the ground clearance under the um, axle tubes, although the overall ground clearance is still governed by the diff housing. Now I realise that to many off-roaders this could be a problem. Now I suspect that the requirements of most um, off-roaders and overlanders differs a little in this area. 
for an off-roader on a technical section, he needs to be able to avoid his, uh, obstacles, picking his way over rocks and tree stumps and so forth, and for this you need to have good ground clearance everywhere. But it's a bit different when overlanding. And for me, the most commonly encountered situation where ground clearance is even an issue is if I'm driving along a deeply rutted track, the ruts get too deep, the diff housing bottoms out and I get bogged down. And this is going to be unaffected by the axle reinforcement. And I suspect that for most overlanders, it wouldn't matter having reinforcement under the axle, providing it's still higher than the bottom of the diff housing. Now, out of interest's sake, I did a little mock-up on the computer to see what it would look like. So we have a heavy-duty rear axle here. I put in T-stiffeners underneath, and it doesn't look very much, does it? But I assure you it's fit for purpose, it'll make a hell of a difference to the life of the axle, and it makes an efficient use of the material. Now this last item is an addendum to the main theme of this video, and it's in response to a question from a viewer on my channel, who asked what I thought about the use of inner sleeves as a means of strengthening axles. Now they do have some advantages, and they're probably simp simpler to install. Uh, because they go down the inside of the axle, it avoids clashes with all of the external attachments and bracketry and so forth. But even so, they're not that simple to install. You've got the design which is an interference fit, and getting them in is going to be a hell of a struggle. Or you've got the other design where, where they're a snug fit, you slide them inside the axles, but you have to attach them by means of plug welds. Neither of, neither of these methods is that simple. But my biggest concern from the engineering side is that the additional material, it isn't being used very efficiently simply because it's too close to the neutral bending axis of the axle. Now to illustrate this point, I prepared this little graphic and I'm plotting the stresses in the axle casing against the thickness of the inner sleeve. I've expressed these stresses as a ratio, and this is the ratio in the axle casing after reinforcing compared to the casing before reinforcing. And this is shown by the blue line which slopes down towards the right. It starts off at unity at the left, as it must, which merely says that if the reinforcing sleeve has zero thickness, then there's no stress reduction. But you'll notice that the curve flattens off. And what this means that is that when the sleeve gets thicker, uh, adding more material has progressively less effect. Now, to put some numbers to this, I've taken an axle tube of nominal size um, 100 millimeters OD by 8 millimeters thick, or in imperial units, this is 4 inches by 5 sixteenths, and I've taken a reinforcing sleeve which is a quarter inch thick, or 6 millimetres, which seems to be typical. Now, um, with these numbers, we find that the stress ratio is 0 0.65, which means that the stresses have come down by 35%. Now, this will give significant improvement in the fatigue life of the um, axle tube, uh, but it's not going to save you if you're doing extreme off-roading and rock crawling. I've also plotted the weight ratio, which happens to be 0.65 also, and this means that the reinforcing sleeve weighs 65% uh, um, of the weight of the axle tubes. Now, I do have one reservation about using inner sleeves to reinforce axles. They're very unlikely to be used with axles where the casings are made from full-length castings because you need to have a tight, if not interference, fit between the inner sleeve and the axle casing. They're much more likely to be used with axles which are built up from seamless tubes which are welded to the diff housing. And it's these welds which can fail. And certainly after adding the reinforcing, the welds are going to be the weak link. So I would wish to reinforce them. And this can either be done by increasing the size of the weld, which means laying down more weld metal on top, following the correct weld procedure, or by installing local reinforcing, which would be in the form of uh, gusset plates between the axle tubes and the diff housing.
And if you do this, you're going to have an axle which is stronger all round. I'll summarise my thoughts on the various um, axle strengthening systems. Firstly, the proprietary external trussing systems. Well, these have been developed by and for the hardcore off-roading community, and that's where I think they belong. I don't think they've got a place on overland expedition vehicles any more than, say, 40-inch tyres do. Secondly, internal axle sleeves. Well, these are a bit of a compromise all round, but I think they've got a place in the market. They're of moderate installation complexity. Regarding the performance, well, you can easily get an extra 50% on the static strength and maybe two to three times more on the fatigue life, and that's very significant. Once they've been installed, the weak link in the axle is likely to be the welds between the axle tubes and the diff housing, and I would strongly recommend that these welds be reinforced. And finally, my preferred solution for overland expedition vehicles is the welded on structural tees, ideally attached to the underside of the axles. And they're going to be much lighter, cheaper, less complex than the proprietary trussing kits and give much better performance than is possible with the internal axle sleeves. You don't have to buy a proprietary kit, just buy a length of I-beam and a competent fabricator will make it up from there. You can get pretty much any performance improvement you choose merely by selecting the right size sort of structural section. Now the installation should be an absolute doddle. The only downside I can see is the reduced ground clearance under the axle tubes, although the overall ground clearance is still going to be controlled by the diff housing. Well that's it on axle reinforcing. I've got nothing else to say. I'm done and dusted. Now, so far, I've been looking at the strength and life of axle casings. Next time, I want to look at semi-floating axles, and in particular, at their half shafts. And this is a real can of worms. Until then. <laughs>